Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure today to introduce Mr. Steve Edwards, a CEO and author, and most importantly, a public speaker and uh, So, Mr. Edwards, um, sorry, Mr. Edwards is a man who has gone around the country giving his program Zero to Hero, affecting over 15,000 college students nationwide. His book, Who is the Boss of You, uh, has changed the lives of many. He is the CEO um, and owner of his company, Edwards Group, with over 350 employees focusing on real estate and media outlets. And we are glad to have him today. If you please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Edwards. that intro 10 minutes ago and just did it from memory, so that's pretty incredible all we got. Good job, Max. Hey, listen, it's good to be here today. I've got three objectives for you today. Three objectives. One of them is I want to excite you, not about what's going to happen in college, but what's going to happen after college, and get you excited about that. The problem is along the way, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. That's just the, the price you're going to pay. But if I do those two things right, the third thing that's going to happen is with any luck at all, I'm going to change your life. That's what I'm really here for today, to do that. So let's start with getting uncomfortable. Fair enough? So do me a favor. Look to your left real quick. Look to your left. Let the person next to you. Now look to your right. The person next to you. One of you three, according to statistics, is going to graduate from this wonderful university and go home and live with mom and dad. Now you never think it's you, but statistics prove otherwise. Even worse, even worse, two and a half out of three of you, two and a half out of three of you, if you can do that, figure that out, are going to get a job that you don't really, never really wanted and you don't really like. And the reason for that is because you're not prepped for it. And that's what today is all about. See, because how many of you know somebody, know somebody in your life, mom, dad, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, that just hate their jobs? Right? We know people like that, right? Isn't that bizarre? I mean, every day you wake up to go to a job that sucks. Think about that. We do not live in communist China. No one has a gun to their head saying, you've got to do this. And yet, they elect to wake up every day and go suck in their job. <laughs> How's this for motivation, right? <laughs> See, and I have a saying. Here's the deal. It's rough. I told you we're going to get uncomfortable first, but I will make it better. If your life sucks, hear me here. If your life sucks, you suck. <laughs> Straight up, if your life sucks, you suck. Now listen, let me put a precursor on that. I am not sitting here saying life going bad or you're being unlucky, as Dr. Wyman would say, is all your fault. I'm really not. Because things happen to good, bad things happen to good people. But what I am saying is when bad things happen, look in the mirror first. And if you graduate from college without having a clue, when you go get in a job that sucks, that's on you. That's simply on you. And shame on you if that's the case. But the problem you also have is you're not given the tools to succeed. See, these people who go to work and hate their lives every day when they're at work, you can, by the way, you can tell who these people are very simply. They're the ones that say, I cannot wait for five o'clock. Can't wait. Or they say, I can't wait for Friday, because maybe the weekends are mine. They can't take the weekends away from me. And when these people wake up every morning, every morning, six in the morning, getting ready to go to the grinder, okay? The music they hear in their head sounds a lot like this. There we go. Sometimes everything is wrong. That's going to be up to you. But how about this? Everyone do me a favor. Stand up real quick. Just you. Stand up. Now imagine if every day you woke up at 6 in the morning knowing you were going to a job that not only did you enjoy, but you were passionate about it. You couldn't wait to get in there, kick ass, and take names. Imagine that. Imagine if you just woke up realizing, okay, it's a work day. It's Monday. But I don't care. And all of a sudden when you wake up, it sounds like this. Take this in. Just take it in. It's my favorite song. Six in the morning.
to them. It sure beats the previous one, doesn't it? And yet, two and a half of the three of you are going to hear that crappy song every day that you wake up. And I hate that for you. And that's why I'm here and I'm passionate about helping students get ahead in life. All right? And that's what I'm going to show you today is the three steps it's going to take to get you where you need to be and hopefully change your life in the next 40 minutes. Fair enough? So let's talk about some myths that are coming down your way that you're told that simply are just not true about the real world. Okay? You're told this. Welcome to the real world. It sucks, but you're going to love it. Yeah. Whoa, who tells you that stuff, right? If you wake up here in that rock music every day, the real world does not suck. It doesn't for me. Okay, but you're told that and you believe it. Because here's the deal with the real world, guys. I got bad news. Here's the uncomfortable again. You are going to work your ever-loving butt off in the real world, whether you like it or not. The real world, you've got to work. And by the way, isn't it funny? But when you graduate college, no one tells, says it's the real world anymore. It's just the world. I don't think you're living in the pretend world now, but I don't I really understand the real world. But in the business world, you're going to work hard. And I tell you, if you love what you do, you know, you've heard the cliche, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Have we heard that? Total crap. Okay? That is total crap. Here's the real cliche. If you love what you do, you're going to have days in your life that suck at a level you didn't know they could suck that bad. And you're going to go back for another one. Because when you love what you do, it's just a bad day. And you're ready for the next one. But if you hate what you do and you're hearing that crappy, sad music every morning, your world just gets worse and worse and worse. And that's back on you because you didn't have a plan coming out of college to make that happen. People come out of college, you're told in college, hey, you're not going to have any work-life balance. Nope, just work, work, work. That's just not true. And I'll show you how. You're also told, hey, listen, you've got to do what your major tells you to do. By the way, I mentor hundreds of students like yourself for free because I'm very passionate about helping you get where you need to be and giving you the tools to do it. And I would say, the ballpark, 85% of them never do the major that they chose after they graduated. Because listen, it's not fair. At 18 years old, you were asked to define your lifelong career vis-a-vis -vis a major. Listen, I graduated college not having a clue what I wanted to do. I left college not having a clue what I wanted to do. I feel your pain. I think this is what makes me passionate about teaching you now because if someone had told me some of these things, I would have gone a whole lot farther, a whole lot faster than graduate college and go into the unemployment agency or the employment agency and trying to figure out what they can do to get me work. That's what I did when I was 22 years old. I get it, okay? So listen, do what your passion is. We're going to break that down in just a minute. And finally, if all these three, three, three things aren't working out for you, you have one backup insurance policy happening in your life, okay? It looked like that. Mom and dad. They, if you don't know what you want to do in life, mom and dad will help you out with that. They'll tell you what you should do. And again, I'm here to tell you, you are young adults. This is your life, not their life. If they pay for your college, thank them. But at the end of the day, choose your own life. Don't let someone else choose it for you. That's what's critical. You're an adult now. Act like it. Fair enough? So I'm going to give you three steps today, three simple steps to bring this to fruition. Fair enough? Step one, I simply say this, you've got to get a plan. Now that hurts my heart a little bit because if someone had said that to me when I was in college, totally lost, I'd be like, yes, yeah, Steve, that's awesome. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get a plan. It's like setting goals, we're going to do all these things. How many of you from Fun and Games take personality tests to try to figure out what you want? Yeah, right? I did all of them. I did all. They don't work. They just don't work. I wish they did, but they don't. So I was just as confused as anybody else. But let me ask you this. What if I told you, if you want to find all the success in your life that you could ever imagine, all you've got to do is get your car and drive out in the western part of the United States. Just drive out west and you'll find it. Most people attempt this. And this is what happens. It's a big place. It's a really big place. California, Utah, Idaho, Montana. Nevada, it keeps going. You can spend your whole life stumbling and fumbling out west trying to figure out where success is and never find it. Never find it. That's most people. But what if I told you this, and this is a metaphor, but what if I told you this? What if I said to you, all you've got to do is find Denver? Okay? Downtown Denver, right there. Now, this is a metaphor, but I have college students and adults across the country talking to me about their Denvers. And Denver is simply this it's a landing spot. It's an idea, it's a dream, it's a hope, it's an aspiration. It's a place I want to travel to one day. It's a job that I would love to have, even though in my heart I probably don't believe I could do it. That's another problem college students have, is you don't believe you can do what really is achievable. 
but you'll never achieve anything until you find a landing place such as a Denver. And we call them Denvers when you have this big, hairy, audacious goal that, ugh, if I could do anything, damn straight I'd do that. I just don't know how to do that. And that's probably not me anyway. They're not going to choose me. So then we go on and we play the slow music and suck. All right? I'm going to fix that for you. Because here, here's how you find, help find some of your dinners. Okay? First of all, you've got to do what we call flow. Flow is simply this, an academic term that is, I, I really enjoy. Because how many of you go to situations, maybe even some classes, that you're sitting there and time seems to go backwards? Right? We have that? Yeah. It's horrible, isn't it? That's most people's jobs. But how about when you do something in your life, and I don't care if it's fun, if it's planning an intramural game, I don't know what it is, but time you look up and two hours has just evaporated. You know those points? Those are when you've got to stop and say to yourself, why did I enjoy that so much that time evaporated? And then what I do is those are all clues to try to figure out maybe that's not your career, but maybe that's the arena you want to play in so that you can go do that every day of your life. And being a job where time flies because you're just having fun and you're busy and you're productive and you're, you're making a difference in life. That's what you got to stop. When you have flow moments, stop and ask yourself why. Okay? The other answer you got to ask yourself is here. Here's a really simple one. I really wish someone had told me this when I was in school. What would you do if money were no object? Bear with me here. Imagine if right now you had a million dollars in your bank account. Straight up. I'm not trying to be facetious here. A million bucks in your bank account. Thousands more pouring in every day. Good for you, okay? You go buy the Lambo and the Ferrari, you go to Greece for six weeks, you nap as long as you can nap, drink as much as you can drink, and when you're through all that, you sit there and say, I've gotta do something in my life that looks like purposeful meaning. What would you do for free if, it, if money wasn't driving you? Because Dr. Wyman will long prove to you that those that chase their passions versus money win every time. Because like I said, in the real world, you're going to work hard. And when you love what you do, you're not trying to get out of there at 5 o'clock at night. You don't care if you're there at 7 o'clock. You don't care if it's Sunday morning. I don't. It's just what I do. Now, I don't, Wednesday afternoon, I might be screwing around, too. Okay? But if it's Saturday morning and you ask me to work, that's fine. You know, you got to ask yourself, what would you do if I called you on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning and said, yo, Cassandra, I need you. Come in. Those that love their job would be like, cool, I'll be right there. Those that hate their job would be like, oh, hell no. This is Sunday morning. You're not getting me. You don't own me on a Sunday. Okay? That's the difference. Fair enough. And so for someone like myself, you call me to go to an airport because aviation is one of my passions, I'll be there night or day. I just love being there. Fair enough? So you've got to ask yourself, where are your Denver's? And you've just, you don't have to have them right now, but you start, have to start identifying some. And I have at least 10 or 15 Denver's running in my head at any one time. Do I accomplish them all? Absolutely not. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But without a destination in mind, you will never get to any semblance of success in your life that you ever wanted. You'll just be stumbling out west. Now listen, here's another problem with, with step one and getting a Denver. Is when you've identified this really cool, like I say, a, a hairy, audacious goal. God, if I could do that, if I could be that ESPN journalist, if I could be that X, Y, or Z, how cool would that be? And then what you do is you start getting excited and you start talking about it because it slowly starts becoming maybe believable. Maybe. And then this next group of people will reach into your soul and rip it out. And I call them idiot friends. Yes, idiot friends. Okay, let's own this. Who's got idiot friends? Go on, own it. Own it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. Okay, now, I've done this. I've talked to over 15,000 students in settings like this. Someone tell me, I have an idiot friend because they're, tell me, fun. They're fun, right? Are idiot friends fun? They're fun. They're idiots. I mean, really, they're idiots. You know what idiots do? They wallow in a pool of pity. It's bad for me, it's bad for you, let's just suck together. My grades are bad, so are yours. Come on, let's go have a beer. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a job? I don't even, come on, high five, woo! Okay, the welcome sign is always on with idiots, always. And when you sit there and tell them about this little hairy, audacious cold that called Denver that this guy talked about, what do you think? They will go, dude, that is not you. You can never do that. And just like that, they will rip your soul out. 
On the contrary, you've got quality friends. And I hope you have some of those. The difference is we don't take the time to know the difference. Quality friends believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. And I'm laughing because I've had so many instances of achieving something at a super high level that I did not believe I could do. But I was smart enough to know who my idiot friends were and who my quality friends were. And I went to my quality friends and said, what do you think? And they're like, dude, that's you. you can, how can we help you? How can we do that? See, one of your quality friends here will say, listen, I'm getting bad grades too, but let me show you what I'm doing about it. I don't have a job either, but here's the three things that I'm working on to make an accelerator for me. Let's come along with me. See, that's what you've got to realize. One of my highest, top level quality friends in this room is Dr. Wine. Without him, I would not have a book, I would not have a speaking career, and I wouldn't have a lot of things because that guy believed in me when I didn't believe in him. And he invited me to his class about 10 years ago to speak, and he encouraged me to write a book. He does things that twist your mind up and get you going, okay? But the highest quality individual you can ever ask for, and I'm forever indebted to him for doing that, okay? So just know the difference. I'm not saying go to your, your idiot friends and go, you're an idiot, you're out of my life, okay? All I'm saying is we only have so much time for those that we love and enjoy. Spend it wisely. Spend it wisely, because I'm telling you, they will strip you down naked in your thoughts as far as when you have a Denver that you really think you might be able to do. Don't let them do that, okay? That's step one, find your Denvers. And again, this is foundational because without it, we can't move forward. Okay, so step two is simply this. You've got your Denvers, you're developing those Denvers, you're working them out. Now the other mistake a college student makes, and I'm stereotyping it because it's true, <coughs> is you just assume it's good or bad. From what you've heard, what you've read on the internet, which we all know is true, okay, right? So, but what you don't go do is truly vet the situation to see if it's really good or not, a good idea or not. So that's why I say step two is simply this. I call it the most important word in the English language, and it's that word right there. It's just advice. Listen. If you go out and you have this great big goal, and let's say you want to be an uh, electrical engineer, all right, that's your big deal, and I, if I can do anything, I'd do that. Whatever. You all know something in your mind, and if you don't, you will. You've got a few months or years to figure it out. But then what you've got to do is you've got to go ask someone for their advice that's doing it. See, advice is free to ask for, it's free to give, and we're thankful and we're actually very appreciative that you like us enough to actually want our advice. But no one ever asks. No one ever does. And if you came to me and said you wanted to be a pilot, okay, I've been a pilot for 38 years maybe, okay, I've flown about everything that flies, and you said I want to be a pilot, what, here's the question you want to ask these people. Knowing what you know about X world that you want to be in, you don't want to say, do you think it's a good idea? Because they'll go, yeah, go for it. Because, you know, whatever. But if you ask me this, if you, and, and Dr. Wyman alluded to this earlier, if you could go back to being your age, if, you could go back, if I could go back to being 20 years old, knowing what I know about that particular field, what would you do differently? It's gold, because here's what I call it. I call it turning decades into days. Decades of wisdom, knowledge, experience, hard knocks. You dip into that pool by one, one really good question, and you get to let me just pour out 30 years of the pain, suffering, success, whatever came along in that path, and then what you do is you simply say, okay, I've got this Denver, and you go out and get advice, and you, you start establishing reference points, is what I call it. It's X, Y graph, here's what happens. You can't just ask one person, you've got to ask three or four at least, of people doing the same thing. And by the way, no one will ever be mad at you for asking for advice. Okay, imagine if a, if a high school senior, how many seniors in here, seniors in here? Okay, seniors, for you guys. Imagine if a high school senior came to you and said, hey listen, I'm going to CFC next year, I'm a little nervous. Can I just get some advice? You've been there four years now. What, would you do? what do you wish you knew when you were a senior in high school versus what you know now? Would you be like, piss off, young kid? No, right? And is that an easy question? Are you kind of glad to ask? And could you give them some just amazing wisdom? And wouldn't that calm your nerves a little bit when you were in high school if doing that? Could you just ask someone who's been doing it? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. The reference points, you get them crack jobs, okay? You know, the ones up top that say, go to Costa Rica, live in the Amazon forest, and never come back home, okay? Leave those people alone. 
But after you talk to four or five of these people, you'll see a cluster of the exact same answers happening over and over and over again. That's where the meat is. And then you know what you do? You've got this Denver, and you're getting a little excited about this possible career. You've gone and asked people who are doing it for advice, dipped into that ladle of experience, and then what I call you smear it all over you, okay? You take the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you, because that's what you're going to have in your life coming at you if you choose to do this. And you, what you do is you decide right then and there as you're laying in bed. If you're laying in bed and you're like, man, I'm even more excited about this, you're on to something. But if you're in bed going, holy hell, what am I signed up for? Stop. Eject that Denver and find another one. Fail fast. Okay? Instead of spending five years of your life doing something that you just now are learning because you didn't ask any questions, how bad it really is. I do this with everything in my life, by the way, almost daily, because I am not the smartest guy in the room, okay? I assure you of that. But even the best example I can give you is when I am a, buying a new car, okay? And it's probably a $50,000 plus car. What I do, and I'm a freak, I'm a little bit of an extrovert, but if you pull up into that car in a parking lot over at Publix, I'll, hey, I'll welcome take, excuse me, excuse me. So I just need your advice real quick. I'm looking to buy that car, what can you tell me about that car that you don't like? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, well, when I buy it, boom, and I'm listening now. And I'm smearing it all over me. So well, here's the deal, guys. They've driven that car. They've driven that car 30,000 miles. They know everything about that car. I've gone on a four-mile test drive. I think I know about that car, but I'm not anywhere near the 30,000 mile. Same example is with business, okay? And after I hear from a few people in the parking lots, okay, my... I'll be able to make an objective decision whether I really want to own that car or not. And I've heard business owners when asked that question by students, I've heard everything from, I love this job, but here's the, here's the new thing that if I were to go back to being your age, here's the angle I would take. And it adjusts you five degrees to make it just perfect for the, the new age of stuff coming out. I've also heard people say, and it's painful to hear, I've heard them say, for the love of God, I would never do this job again in my life. I've heard that. And it's, it's a shame because what happens when you get to be my age and you've sucked in your job for 30 years and you've had that slow music playing every day? What you end up doing is you don't, you're not waiting for 5 o'clock on Fridays anymore. It's sad. <laughs> what they say is, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I've only got 14 more years until I retire. Damn, right? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to blow up another 14 years. That's why I like college students to catch up early before you're so far down that rabbit hole. Um, so there, you get your Denver's, thank you. You get your Denver's, and you go and you get advice. Again, people are dying to give you advice if you just ask, and you ask the right question, which is, what would you do if you were me? Not do you think it's a good idea. If you go back to being my age and get to do, I get a do-over, what would you do? Fair enough? Step three, if you've got that Denver, now it's gonna get real, okay? You can put that advice all over you, and you are like, I'm in. I'm making this crap happen. This is me. This is what I was built for. Step three is very simple. You have to bring a tremendous amount of what I'm about to tell you. But let me, let me set it up before I forgot about the slide. If I was going to hire all of you, this is how I illustrate that in step three. If I was going to hire all of you, right here, right now, one of you is going to get the job. And I said to you, how many of you think if one of you were going to get the job, how many of you think grades, your grades, are solely and standalone going to let you get that job, baby? My grades are going to win every day. Show of hands, be proud, get them up high. Yeah, I know the answer before I ask it. Like I said, over 15,000 students, never has a hand gone up to that question. Never won. Which I find ironic because you're stressing, getting anxiety, taking Adderall, to get good grades. Yeah, we know. We know about that. <laughs> so, so again, I'm not saying for the professor's sanity that grades are not important. What I am telling you this is when you get out of school, no one will ever ask you what your grade point average was ever again. And probably not your major. Really won't. So how many of you think it's experience? Experience wins the day. Yay! Who has experience? Oh, college. I get it. You shouldn't have experience because you're in college. It's a trick question. Here's what I was driving toward. That's the answer right there. When you have a Denver and you have advice to make sure you're going down the right road, it's not going to be a dead end, you have got to pour 
a ton of desire all over. The problem is this, is everyone, college students on up, have really kind of forgotten what desire looks and feels like. Because you're like, yeah, I want it really bad. No, that's not desire. Desire is a hunger that comes from within you that is so strong and powerful, no one can get in your way. Now, I used to use this slide here to explain that. That when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, you'll be successful. Well, that's great. But I found a better one. Just the other day. That really kind of illustrates what I'm talking about when it comes to desire. Because I'm going to give you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a successful person, today being me, and show you behind the curtain, almost like the Wizard of Oz. And I'm telling you, any successful person does this. They just don't show it to you. Because all we want to do, like Dr. Wyman did, was show you that, hey, 13 dead and drive, it was great, it was great. The pain and suffering and effort that he put forth to make that happen, let alone the other 74 toys that he invented, are off the charts. I have personally witnessed him doing things that he could have been doing a lot of more fun things. And he's not going to talk about it because we don't want to talk about the things that really created the desire to win. But if you don't have it, you're going to lose no matter how good you think you might be. So this next slide, I'm not a big fan of reading slides, but I'm going to read this slide to you because I want, it, I want you to truly understand what I'm talking about. It's a lot of words, so bear with me. It says, why do I succeed? I succeed because I'm willing to do the things you are not. I will fight against the odds. I will sacrifice. I'm not shackled by fear, insecurity, or doubt. I feel them, drink them in, swallow them away to the blackness of hell. I'm motivated by accomplishment, not pride. Pride consumes the weak, kills your heart from within. If I fall, I will get up. If I'm beaten, I will return. I will never stop getting better, and I will never give up, ever. And I will succeed. And you want to see what's behind every successful person? That. That. And if you don't have a Denver that establishes that kind of passion and advice to make sure you're not screwing up doing it, you'll never get to this level. See, the, one of the ways I illustrate that is, how many of you guys play some intramural sports? Just sports in general, right? Okay, yeah, I get that. Okay, anyone play some basketball? Who's good? Who's, okay, way in the back in the blue, what's your name? Dylan. What? Dylan. Dylan? Yeah. All right, Dylan. So Dylan and I are going to go play some basketball. And Dylan's a good basketball player. And, and I'm twice his age, and I'm like, hey, Dylan, Dylan. This is most, most of us play this game because we want Dylan to be spooled down. Dylan, hey, listen, go easy on me. I'm old. I'm bad. You know, just, let's just go have some fun today and just scoop it up. Okay, Dylan's going to come out and probably give me, whether he wants to or not, a good 70% effort. But what if I came to Dylan and said, Dylan, I'm going to make you my bitch today. I'm going to dunk on you. I'm going to just power through you. I'm going to knock you on your butt. You're never going to know what happened. Then it's on. All of a sudden, we're not at 70% anymore, are we? <laughs> Dylan's bringing his A game. I don't want that. See, that's why we keep it hidden to a large degree. And two, the pain of the effort that we did to get where we got is not something we really want to relive. Straight up. There's a lot of pain involved in that, but when you love what you do, you just keep powering through it. You know, one, one way I also illustrate that is if we were all in a room together in the lobby waiting to be interviewed by Dr. Weiner, I'd be going around going, hey, high five, Cassandra, good luck, girl, let's do this, may the best person win. Really, best person win, I'm, you know, I'm a team player. When that door closed behind me and I walked into the interview's office, I would want to kick your ass inside out, upside down. Okay, because I'm doing that. And if you're not, you're gonna finish second. And in the military, what do they call second place? The first, first loser, who said that? Good for you, the first loser. I don't want you to be the first loser. That's why I'm here. I want to position you to do that. But if you said to Steve Edwards, being me, hey, go sell some insurance, which to me is a living nightmare, okay? I couldn't do that. No one can do that. I might be able to do it for three hours, bless you. I might be able to do it for three hours, but I can't do that because I don't like it. That's why the Denver is such an important starting foundational place, okay? So, in my book, I dumbed it down because that's the world we live in. But I got this graphic that just kind of explains it for me. It's just what it could have, should have did. That's really what it is, is I'm never in the what it could have, should have category. My friends will tell you that when Steve's gonna do something, he goes and does it. But I also had a friend illustrate to me about a year ago, I found it eliminating, because you never really know yourself that well. He has never seen me speak, doesn't know me from this angle at all, he knows me from my businesses. He said, Steve, it's interesting, when you look like you just pop your head up out of water, you've made a decision, and it's full speed ahead. 
I was like, okay. He's like, that's not what you do. And I said, okay, what do I do? And he goes, you've identified what it is, the target you want. He goes, and then underneath the water, you have figured out all the angles to make sure you're doing the right thing right. He goes, and when you finally pop your head above water, it looks like you've just made an instant decision, where in reality, you have made a decision long before that with a ton of research. And I was like, holy crap. I do exactly what I'm talking about here. I just do it without even thinking anymore, because I've been doing it so long. Okay? Don't be a woulda, coulda, shoulda. Those people are not living the lives you want to lead. Okay? So, let's get to the, 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 the last phase. How do we take all this and turn it into a dream job? Okay? Here's where we're going to start having some fun. All right? How do you get your dream job knowing all this? It's very simple. This next slide will illustrate exactly how to get your dream job. It's this. Say what? Say what? Right? I love it. So what we got here is a box literally outside the hen house. Now, those hens are locked up pretty tight. You know, the top, bottom, left, right, they're in there pretty, pretty safely. Box is outside looking at them. Who would agree chickens are safe? I'd agree. I, I think they are. Anyone think they're safe? We all agree? So what happens if I just open the door or let the fox in for just a 10 minute visit? <laughs> just a 10 minute visit. What do you think? Bye bye chickens. Feathers are flying, chickens are dying. Okay? It's a shit show. Chickens are dying. See, here's the deal, guys. You're the fox. But the problem is, the chickens are the people in the building you'd like to work inside of, and you're in the parking lot, wishing you could get in the building. And if you could get in that building, you would eat, and feathers would fly, and chickens would die. And what I teach students how to do is get into the building. And again, it's just something that you're not getting a whole lot of in your life, all right? And that's what I do. And I do it by one thing. And if I'm known by anything, it's this next slide. And it's that. I call it in my world, a moment of courage. A moment of courage. See, when I talk to students one-on-one -on -one who have this kind of desire, those that don't have desire never make it to me, OK? But those that do and, and really want to go kick butt and take names, I teach them. I, don't, I will not teach you how to dress for an interview, your resume, what your strengths and weaknesses are. You have the Career Center for that. Good, good luck. Okay, do all that. That's not what I do. I teach students like yourself, and adults as well, for 30 seconds. 30 seconds in an interview. That's it. And I call it a moment of courage. A moment of courage. And what that is to me is I call it bringing a sledgehammer to a glass party. Okay? At some point, you have to rear back and you have to destroy everything in that room. And what I say is, you let your, I, I teach you, and this is something you have to be taught, you just can't be told that you're good to go, okay? It requires some thought, introspection, and, and reflection to figure it out. But what I show you how to do is when you're at that Denver and you just, God, I want to be here, this is it. I've got the advice, I know it, I've, I've got all the desire in the world to do it, I just gotta get in the building. I show you how to get your heart out of your mouth. And when you can get that out of your mouth, that everything changes for you, and I call it a moment of courage. Here's what that looks like. By the way, the other problem employers have, like myself, is if I took 10 of you up against the wall, and one of you truly, truly wanted that job, like I just explained. Five guys are in suits, five ladies are in wonderful dresses, they're all smiling, they're all saying the same thing, they're all on point, being nice, and yes sir. I can't tell who's who, who really wants to be there, because you're taught to stay politically correct. When you get out there, it's not politically correct anymore. And what a moment of courage does is it allows you to do this. Yo, right here. I'm the one. And we go, oh, oh, thanks, come on. We needed you. You know, everyone watched The Voice on TV? Blake Shelton does it better than anybody. Four judges, singers trying to decide which judge is going to make them number one. And Blake Shelton, after all the talk is done, he sits there and just does this. That's all he's got to do. And he's won more contests than any other judge on the show. The best nonverbal I've ever seen. The moment of courage does that for the interviewee, for you. And what that looks like is this, and just a quick tip there. What's your name? Ashley. Ashley. Ashley's interviewing me, okay? So I'm, I'm you. And in, the, in every interview, there is a pause, there's a hesitation, there's a moment. Trust me, when you look for it, it's there. And when it's there, that's when the moment of courage has to come through. And it, it looks something like, 
I'm sitting there in the chair, we're having this wonderful conversation, and there's this pause, and I say, Ashley, it's Ashley. Ashley, I, I need to explain something to you very clearly. And you'll be like, whoa, okay, what's this about? Say, so listen, I know you've interviewed people before me, and by the way, my eyes are locked, the volume's on 10, I am full-blown go right now. I've got 30 seconds to bring it, okay? This is not a sit back in your chair, hey, type thing, okay? This is a lean-in moment. Said, so listen, I know you've interviewed people before me, and you're going to interview people after me, but I promise you this, no one wants this job more than I do. I don't care if it's nights, weekends, you say jump, I say how high. I'm the guy. I'm the guy that gets it done when no one else does, and all I need from you is an opportunity to show you that. And I'm out. Now we can talk about strengths and weaknesses. Do you want to hire that person? Who would hire that person? Damn straight you would. So would everyone else out there. That's how you go take what you deserve instead of get it and get whatever's given to you. You just got to be trained for a moment of courage. That's what has to happen, okay? And that's how I get a lot of things done. Now here's, I'm going to finish up with four students that illustrate this. And I've got 25 to 30 behind him, okay? This guy's name is Doug Toodle. He graduated, no job. Found me in downtown Clemson. So he, he uh, found me in downtown Greenville, wanted some help. We sit down. His big dream, Denver, was career builder. Anyone know career builder? I don't know why. Doesn't matter. It's not my Denver. It's his Denver. He wanted to be at, at career builder. We positioned him to get an interview. He got an interview. He went, did the moment of courage, did it all, and literally finished second. Only because the guy before him had 10 years of experience, and he was already keyed in, ready to go. But the guy said, listen, it's not that we don't want you. You just give us a month, and here's how it works. They said, in one way or another, they said, as soon as somebody basically blinks and half assed it at this company, you're going to be here. You're going to fire them. They didn't say quite that way, but that's how it works. Sure enough, a month later, they called him up. We need you. He goes to career builder. He, and then, then the you mind, he's at his dream job. And everyone else at Career Builder just went to the career fair and got a job. So they're waiting for five o'clock. They're doing this. He calls me up and says, Steve, you won't believe this. No one here wants to work. No one here wants to work. He goes, I'm kicking butt, taking names, winning all the awards, doing everything. He goes, it's because they just want to leave and get out of here. I love this place. And sure enough, about six months later, I steal something off his Facebook page. He's in Cabo San Lucas. Sure, he's giving everyone hell. And down below is the, bot, the, the real kicker. I didn't pay for this. Thanks, career builder. He's winning the awards, okay? Here's another guy, Mike Triller, Clemson grad. Played baseball, it just was barely not good enough to play in the pros, but he was good. I watched him play. About a year after he graduated, he graduated in 15. This is an old one. 16, he finds me at a dodgeball tournament, okay? He's really the guy you want in a dodgeball tournament, I'll tell you. But he's unemployed a year later, has no clue. So he finds me and says, hey, I heard you speak. Can we get together? We spent three hours in McAllister's Deli, and I walked him through, because he had all the skills and desire, and I walked him through a lot of things, but one of them was a moment of courage. And in doing so, he wanted to work. And eventually, his goal was the Yankees, the New York Yankees. But he was, he was trying to get an interview and get on with the Washington Nationals in the meantime. And he said, I'm waiting for to hear back from them. I'm waiting to hear back from them. I said, dude, we don't wait. Let's go take what we deserve. Let's go make this happen. So I walked with him, it was on a Monday. On a Wednesday, he called me. I, I'll never forget where I was on the road. He goes, hey, Steve, Steve, Steve. He goes, I called up the Washington Nationals guy, I got him on the phone, we started talking. He goes, and just like you said, there was a moment for the moment of courage. I said, yeah, yeah, Mike, I, and, and he's like, and I bailed. And I'm like, why'd you call me, right? <laughs> so he says, yeah, he goes, so the guy went on, and he goes, I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, he said, listen, if there's, a, if there's a job that opens up here that we can fit you in, we'll talk to management, and you know, let us get back to you if that happens. Blew him. I said, so I'm kind of annoyed that I spent all that time with him, and that happened. I said, okay, what happened then? And every moment in your life, there's gonna be a moment where you've just gotta decide, are you gonna win or are you gonna lose? And he says, and I'll, this is verbatim. He said, Steve, I get goosebumps when I tell the story. He goes, I looked at the phone, and I said, hell no, that's not gonna happen to me. I picked the phone back up, dialed his number. He said, I can't believe he answered the phone. I said, okay, and he goes, I just didn't wait for the moment of courage, I just had it. He goes, I was yelling in the phone, I'm the guy, I'm the guy that's gonna get things done. He went through the whole thing. And I was like, okay. I said, so what happened? And he goes, the guy said, you're hired, you start Friday. 
So ironically, that Friday, I'm in Starbucks with another student, and Mike comes from Monday unemployed. Friday, he comes walking in, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, just getting some gear, going to Daytona for spring training. That was March. It's all the Nationals, but he's got a bigger goal. He wants to be the, with the Yankees, but now the Fox got in the hen house, and he be eating, okay? He, and he got on, and all of a sudden, he's meeting the director of marketing. They're going to coffee, they're doing this, they're doing that. And in December, he calls me up and says, hey, and see, so he actually sent me a text in December, and the text looks like that. Yo! Now, it's a video position. Let's not be impressed by that, okay? And I do my thing, you know, I'm kicking out, that's how we talk, right? Go get it. So he went to the Yankees, got on with the Yankees, and as a video director, I'm not impressed. The fox got in the hen house of the Yankees, okay? And all I gotta do is wait six to eight months for him to call me back, because he'd be eating. And he called me last week. I was like, hey, do you run the company yet? He's like, no, no, no. I said, what are you doing? And it's not video. So he's now like the agent of the agents for all the players. Any need they have from hotels to this to that, everything else, he's, he's the guy. Dr. Martin was telling me he was going to see the Yankees next week. I said, dude, you should have called him. Because man, I'm hooked on that one, right? So, but Mike, and all of a sudden now he's like, yeah, the Yankees are great, but it's just, it's just the baseball team. He's not near as impressed as he was. He's just leveling up. And he's 26 years old. Okay? Here's another one, Katie. Katie Nissan. She graduated, she wanted to be in the clothing business. She wanted to be a buyer for a clothing company. We positioned her, got her going. She sent me an email. After, and then again, it's a lot of conversations. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. And I only had this up there, it's hard to read, but I, I highlighted it in the yellow. And she said, I was able to gather myself in a moment of courage during the interview. Da, da, da. This is where I have to start before having the dream job of becoming a buyer, but I'm happy to do it. The fox got in the hand house. So guess what? It's about time, about this last summer, it was about time for me to get a phone call. Hey, Steve, guess what? This, it happens over and over again. And I, I know the answer. I know the answer to that. Well, here's what she did. This has never happened before. She didn't call me. Her dad did. Okay? With the most gratitude you've ever heard a dad have. And he said, not only do I appreciate what you've done for my daughter, he goes, but I wanted to tell you something. She's busy getting married right now, but Belk, who she got with, created a whole new position just for her to be a buyer. They said they didn't have the position, but she was so good, they created one just for her to move up with. And she is blown and going in the Belk world right now as a buyer. <laughs> That's how it works. And bringing the anchor lay home, you got this guy. Wow. This guy is not a fox. He is a werewolf. Okay. His name is Bradley Fulton. And I took this picture of him, and it looks like it's all great there. And it, it could not have been any worse. Okay. When I met him, he called me, wanted me, after I spoke to a class, we sit down, he's running an all-state insurance call center right here. Class is over 350. Okay. He's running an all-state insurance call center, working 40 hours a week. His mom is dead. His dad doesn't know him. He's $100,000 in debt. He's got no backstop. He's basically making minimum wage, trying to get through Clemson the best he knows how. And the stress of life was on him to the point that he was literally about to drown. And I did something I've never done before or after, is it was so bad, I emptied my pockets of my cash, and I was going on a trip the next day, so I was loaded, right? And I, I gave him the, all my cash, and I said, listen, just breathe. Just breathe. Seriously, that's exactly what I said. It's going to be okay if we're going to figure this out. Because what I knew that he didn't know is he had the desire of any three college students I've ever met in my life. Okay? That's why I said he's not a fox. He's a werewolf. And he's like the Tasmanian devil. When you give him something to do, he goes and does it. I mean, I gave him my book, which I'll give any of you today for free if you read it. He called me three hours later apologizing for not being done with it. And he was serious. So I had to be very careful what I tasked him with because he was going to eat it. Well, I said, let's position you throughout this year, this is senior year starting in on that August, to have a job by the time it's Christmas so you can coast through your, your last semester and not be stressed over school and just be looking forward to your job. He came to my house in December with four job offers because, again, we positioned him to do that because he understood how to do the moment of courage and he had desire out the wazoo. He picked one with Microsoft, okay? Microsoft hired him on the spot, right here. Now he works for Microsoft. He started at $115,000 a year with stock options and signing bonus, all right? And he's working out, he worked out of his house. Okay, he's a great job. 
And, but they didn't know they hired a werewolf. <laughs> okay? So last spring, what is it? September, not March, he calls me and says, hey, Steve, guess what? And I'm like, holy crap. Okay, what happened? He goes, well, I got advanced over to the sales team. He goes, the sales team, there's five people on this particular sales team for Microsoft. He goes, four of them, we do renewal sales of existing business. We go out and get new sales. And he says, so the new sales that the four people combined make are $250,000 a quarter. I said, great. How'd you do in your first quarter? He goes, I did $1.2 million. Okay. <laughs> and he called me last week and I said, hey, I'm speaking about, I'm using you again in the speech next week. Where are you now? He's like, $2.2 .2 million. He's making a quarter of a million dollars a year. He's now married, got a kid on the way. Now he lives from Washington, he lives in Charlotte. And he said to him in three years, if he's still with Microsoft, he'll be making at least a half a million dollars. Because whatever gets in, in Bradley's way, he eats. And he eats fast. Okay? He's not a fox, he's a werewolf. So I say all that to just to, to leave with this. And it's so, so true, isn't it? It's so true. Everyone's self-made, but only successful men. But more importantly than that, I've spent, and I appreciate your attention, I've spent the last 40 minutes and everything I've said, everything I've said to get you to this one point in, in time, one point, this is everything I've talked about today, I want you right there. Right there. Because here's the deal. You can go left, you can go right. But one thing that is not going to happen when you leave this room today is you're not going straight anymore. Those days are done. You're not going straight. You have an option. You have a choice. You have a lot of choices. You can go left and be average. Play the slow music. You can leave here tonight. When you're ready to go, you can go out and get drunk. You can go and take a nap. You can go play Fortnite. Yeah, Fortnite, right? While everyone else is just powering by you. Or you can make a choice to do something different with your life today. That's why I'm here. You can take the less traveled road to the right. The road that not many people are on. And sadly, a lot of you are going to take the average road. And I can't stop that. But some of you that are here to take the less traveled road, life is going to be great for you. You're going to, go out, you're going to find your Denver's. You're going to start focusing on them. You're going to start talking to people who can give you the advice that shows you how to kick ass and take names. And then you're going to leave this college and engage in a way that gets you the life that you want to bring the music to your, to your day that just never stops winning. And when you do it, every day you wake up looks like this. And you go out and you rock your world and you win because you've got the tools to do it. That's what I want for you today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Stand up. Favorite part. Let's give them a really good one. 